remember which one of you, if it was one of you who suggested the principle of unity for today's um, focus. So can any of you describe to me what you think the principle of unity means? Just that everything goes together, um, both in terms of the style and the theme, and you know, there's no major conflict there. That works. Anybody else? That elements are repeated. Repetition is a way to create unity. That's true. Thank you, Linda. Anybody else? The cohesive whole. All the parts go together. All the parts create a cohesive whole. Thank you, Diane. That's really good. What is unity not? What would, what would create unity? What would be the opposite of unity? Disjoint. Disjoint? What do you think, Ellen? Oh, chaos. Chaos. What about you, Melanie? Um, I'm not sure. Colors that don't go together? Okay, things that don't go together anything that doesn't go to her. Um, and there's no, as with everything we else, everything else we talked about here, I have floating hands. That's kind of cool. Um, we, there's no one definition for anything we talk about. Um, these are just definitions that I find easily understandable. And they are these that I, ways that I find them easy to categorize and easy to understand. So for me, as you've all said, unity is visual harmony. It is all the elements together create a cohesive whole. The opposite would be having something in there that looks out of place. So in this case, unity is everything looks like it belongs there. Unless, of course, the artist wishes to make you feel uncomfortable or wishes to create um, disharmony and discomfort and visual disunity. There are a lot of easy ways to create unity. And Linda, you mentioned repetition is one of them. So I thought that we would start off with an abstract painting. I'll share my screen. And this is a piece by Wassily Kandinsky. He was one of the first kind of, he was, he was an early abstract artist. He was also a fabulous teacher and taught a lot about the design principles and elements and created pieces that although they were entirely abstract, felt unified, they felt like a harmonious whole. I will unmute you one at a time as I ask you questions. Um, let me make sure I can see all of you. We were getting some interference, so that's why I muted you all. Um, let's start with Becky. I'm going to unmute you, I think. Okay, Becky, go ahead and unmute yourself because my yes, I had muted working. myself. There was some there was some static in there of some kind. Okay, um, Becky, could you name one way that this piece feels unified? And when you speak of it, use the terms and the vocabulary of the elements. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I can see where the lines are all working together to it. They go in a variety of directions, but they all converge and pull the whole piece together, I think. Okay. In terms of, and it's all graphic elements. Okay. So line, they go in different directions, but there are things like there is repeated weight of line. They all pull the eye kind of into the center. So there's 
mostly repetition of direct um, focus of the lines. There are some heavier lines, but mostly thin lines. So do any of the lines here look different or out of place? Well, there's one element that's somewhat different up in the upper left, not the circle, but just to the right of the circle at the top of that blue triangle that's different. Uh, but I don't what know. What element is it and how is it different? Describe it. It's, it's, it's a line that has thickness uh, at the bottom and goes up into a point where most, other than the circular shapes in the whole design, most of them are straight. So that has a little bit different um, flair to it. It's more of a crescent shape. I don't know if that's what. Okay. No, it's always really good to describe what you're seeing. Uh -huh. Let's look. So looking at that specific element, if you can see, you guys can see my cursor, right? Yes. Okay. Circling that element, I'll, I'll call it kind of a horn shape. Now it is thick at one end and thin at the other. Most of the lines are just straight lines with a consistent thickness. This one is thick at one end and thin at the other. But does it look like it's really, really out of place? No. Why? Let's find some things that this line can relate to. Look at the line right below it. There's another squiggly line that has some curves and is also thick at one side and thin at the other. There's nothing exactly like this, but see how this is curved, but there are also curved lines right next to it? Yes. Hmm. And then there's this, these little bits that are also thick on one side and thin on the other. So one of the counterbalances to unity is variety. Unity is often caused through repetition, but too much repetition creates falling asleep kind of artwork, snoozers. Too much repetition is kind of really boring. So you need variety. How do you create variety without creating cal um, chaos? It's a balance that we always have to, um, we have to find as artists. So in this case, there's no other shape or line that's exactly like this horn shape, but there's just enough repetition of um, aspects of that. There's enough other curves, there's enough other thick lines that it doesn't look completely and entirely out of place. All right, Melanie, let's go to you. You're already unmuted. Um, pick another element and describe it and tell us how it creates unity in this piece. I see um, triangles particularly the one in the center with a circle in it. It's uh, two colors, but I see the unity of the repetition of that triangle coming from the small triangles coming through the large uh, triangular shape at the top, more, more of a cone, I guess, but... Um, okay, so shape what you're talking about is shape shape is one of the elements texture shape line color value and form um, we talked a little bit about line and you're right triangles are a shape that are repeated throughout here throughout this piece and as i look at it and as you described the triangles it's interesting that this triangle is broken by a lot of lines but its general direction is upward, right? Yes. Because of these long lines and because it's skinny, it, it's flat on the base, parallel with the base of the frame, and skinny and points upward. Mm -hmm. And then this blue triangle over here is open on the base, which also makes it feel like it points upward. And perhaps just because those two are repeated and because we have this also in the center, mm -hmm. two okay. lines that meet in a triangle without a base, which makes them mm -hmm. feel like they point upward. And mm -hmm. then two repeated yellow triangles 
that feel like they point upward maybe only because so many other triangles do. We also have the triangle that's completely broken up in the center here. It's buried behind other things, but it's also it also has a base parallel with the bottom of the frame. Yes. So all of those triangles, even though no two are the same, they have at least the feeling of direction, the feeling of movement that mm -hmm. is repeated. Very good. Um, who hasn't talked yet? Diane, do you want to give us a try? Tell us about another shape or mm -hmm. another element, any element you choose. Um, I'm debating. Uh, I'm going to try. Hold on. Diane, wait. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself, Diane? No, I did, and then it went you back. You did, and I think I messed it up. I was trying to mute Melanie. OK. Um, um, I'm going to say texture. OK. Describe for, texture for us and how it is used to unify. Well. I'm thinking the, the checkerboard um, elements create a certain texture in the piece. So it's a texture is visual pattern. Yeah. Okay, describe those. Just say what they look like. I don't know, they're just checkerboard patterns. Okay, <laughs> checkerboard <laughs> pattern is good. <laughs> Uh, I mean, they have some elements of color in some places, but not mm -hmm. all. And all right. they have a different spacing or frequency of mm -hmm. the, and size of the uh, shapes that are colored in, but they create a coherent uh, whole in, in where he's placed them and how he's placed them together. Where are they placed? Just tell me, describe what you see. Where are they placed? Um, what about this piece over but, here? Yeah, there's a large grouping on the left, and then there's smaller ones that echo off to the upper right. What about And this? the left one kind of points in that direction, like to move your eye over there to see more. Okay. The way I would describe this is we have several checkerboard patterns, visual texture. Each of them are irregular and mm -hmm partially incomplete. They, um, they're not on an orthogonal grid. In other words, they're not exactly perpendicular and parallel within themselves. One of them sits down in, a, in an arrow set of lines that are pointing down, but it also has more complete edges. It is like an enclosed space. It's got a heavier black line at the bottom. It has greens and blues and yellow and pink and browns in some of the checks, but a lot of them are black and a lot of them are white. And it's not evenly patterned. We have some white spaces that are next to other white spaces and some like the brown and the blue here that are colored next to each other. And then if you look at the, um, grids up here. They are also set into the point of a triangle, but their ends are open instead of enclosed. They're also transparent. You can't see the shapes behind the checkerboard on the left, but you can see them on the right. And in the, in the grids, in the triangles on the right, there are also patterns within instead of just solid colors. These look like they're polka dots or stripes here inside of those checkerboards. And it looks like the only color we have is the red here, besides the color that is showing through from the circle on behind it. So they repeat each other in that they're black and white checkerboards with a little bit thrown in, with a little bit of what color thrown in. Um, but they also are greatly varied. This one is complete and it's more wonky the one on the left is than the one on the right 
um, and the one on the right has patterning in it. And then we also have this tic-tac-toe grid over on the far right that doesn't have black spaces. It's just white and the, the red and the pink, and it's not in a triangle. But all of those things are checkerboards. They repeat each other, but there's a great deal of variety in them. Um, and one thing that I like to do when I'm looking at repetition and unity and harmony, um, unity and variety, is to kind of visually cover up one thing to see what it looks like. So what would happen if we put up our hand and covered up the checkerboard on the far right? If you put up your hand so that, you can, so that you're blocking that piece and look at it, then take it away and look at it. Sometimes you think, does it really belong there or does it not? This piece could work with it or without it. But what would happen if the piece on the left, the, the big checkerboard on the left was covered up? And I always close one eye when I'm covering up part of the piece. I the little red and white checkerboard on the right, if it's covered up, the piece is still unified. It's fine with or without it. It doesn't bother me to have it there. But the piece on the left, the heavier checkerboard, if I cover that up, then it feels unbalanced because it has all these checkerboards on the right and nothing that really repeats it. That would leave a predominance of circular elements on the left and it wouldn't feel as balanced. It wouldn't feel quite as unified and harmonious as it does. Um, let's go to Ellen. Ellen Schwartz, do you wanna choose an element and describe it in this piece and tell us how it creates unity and harmony? You have to unmute yourself though. I feel like every time I try to mute or unmute somebody, I get it wrong. <laughs> so you do. <laughs> Technology is just beyond me. Um, you know, I just noticed something. The use of of um, the color, in particularly in the uh, the large circle in the upper left hand corner and the smaller circle right below it, they're so they're so bright they're so warm and bright they they almost look like they're on another plane they're creating perspective like if you stood on that circle and looked into the picture you would be looking down and hmm. far away okay so they tend to feel like they're coming forward and make the rest of the painting feel like it's receding to you yes you were describing the color in those spaces. Um, the red is very saturated. The black is a very deep value, right? Mm -hmm. it's, there's black throughout the painting, but this is a, an intense, larger area of black. And the purple is also, next to that black, feels like it's one of the darker values. Color and value often get talked about together because they're enmeshed with each other. Um, so we see this purple here. Where else do we see it? Let's see, there's, there's a, uh, hard for me to see, but there is a, a lighter value of purple in the right towards the bottom mm -hmm. circle. And uh, let's see, it looks How like... the red? Is there any other intense red? Uh, not as intense, but there is red in, in some of the grids, looks mm -hmm. like. And there are just little bits of red scattered throughout. There's also some mm -hmm. red in the lines. Um, in several of the lines, there's little tiny bits of red yeah. Yeah. gathering toward the center. Mm -hmm. It feels like a lot of the red, except for this square down at the bottom, are all gathering in toward the center. Mm -hmm. um, very good, Ellen. Do those, what about those colors? Do they feel out of place or do they, how, how does he make them feel like they belong here? No, they, they don't feel out of place. I think part of what he's done 
is he's he's sort of put the particularly the orange he's put closer to a blue so he's got a complementary col color there that they they work off of each other i don't know how to describe it um and two the use of the blue i think is really good because he pulls it all around in different uh different sizes of the circles so it kind of pulls your eye in and around okay so the colors are scattered so they draw your eye to different places if this was the only intense red circle and there was no other red shapes in the piece our eye might be drawn to that richness and warmness and saturation and it might feel over dominant mm -hmm. in the piece um, especially with saturated colors and hot colors like uh, that red or a really intense yellow. You don't need very much, but look how tiny bits of it are scattered throughout the rest of the painting, except for the bigger square on the lower right. That's the next most, um, the next largest bit of red. And it's on the opposite corner of the painting from the top left. So that red is scattered out enough, but not overwhelming. I don't know what just happened and I don't know what, there we go. So it, I, and I lost my train of thought, I'm yeah. sorry. But a, an intense color like that, you really need only tiny bits of it to draw your eye through a word. This is, with my students, this is one of the things um, we learn all the design principles and elements, but then as they start composing, unity is a really, really important principle that um, they need to work on. And often they'll have one thing that is out of place, but they take it away and it just doesn't feel right because it felt like that thing was really important. But sometimes if you put little slivers, little bits of that one thing and in this case it would be an intense red if you scatter it or move it throughout the rest of the painting that gives it just enough repetition that it creates cohesion that it creates a sense of visual unity very good ellen i appreciate it um melanie have you talked to us yet yes i talked Okay. Uh, now that I had a little bit more to look at, of course, you may want to ask other questions, but um, um, it, it, is the overall element more of a grid, not an asymmetrical grid because of the way it's laid out on there? Because it's got geometric, but it has the curves of circles. Um, no, I don't see a grid. Okay. anywhere in this but it is not an entirely random scattering of shapes if you know what i mean um linda have you talked to us thank you melanie good question i was looking at the when you see the entire composition the background substrate color is that pale yellow except blue which plays off of the thicker structure of of blocks those rectangular towers so the color helps us lead our eye through the entire piece the circles and the pale colors where it's very very busy and where it becomes quiet the emptier space was an opposite color okay very interesting so the background color and texture and pattern um let linda go ahead and mute yourself because i think there's weird um interference coming when i talk thanks i appreciate it that was a really really good um thing to see linda that the the unity here part of it is created by that yellow all the way behind throughout the painting and then it changes sometimes to the blue there's not an intense change between the yellow and the blue it's still all very soft and um, pastel and very kind of smoothly textured not a lot of pattern there's a little bit more texture there than um, 
the overall patterning in places like the checkerboards. But just having that background kind of be the same for everything else to float on top of is a unifying element. All right, Cherry, do you want to talk about an element and how it unifies this piece? You have to unmute yourself. Cherry? There I am. There you are, thanks. Uh, I got in late. Uh, well, we're glad you're here. Choose an element um, and- I'm sure it. everybody's already oh. talked about all the elements. There's much yeah. line in this. No, uh, go ahead and talk some more about line. We only mentioned line just a little bit. Describe some of the lines here and how it creates unity in the work. <clears throat> Well, it has a flow from the left to the right. How so? Uh, the direction of the lines for the most part. And um, at least that's the way I read it. Yeah, left to the right, that's me. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I like this piece. And I don't normally like this type of work, but I really like this piece. It's just, it's smiling at me. <laughs> So I mean, you know, I don't, I can't tell you exactly why it's smiling at me. I think it has to do with the uh, half circles and uh, the kind of buoyant feel of the piece. The there line. is a lot of ac visual activity here. Uh, There's energy. <laughs> so one of the reasons this might carry your eye from left to right is it does feel like most of the lines go from on a diagonal from the lower left to the upper right. We have um, partly we've got this heavy line here in the bottom of the checkerboard that stops the eye from going that direction and then it's got strong lines that move up toward the right. We've got thicker to a thin line so this curvy bit definitely brings your eye up. We've, we talked about this line a little bit that's thicker and then thinner. These go a different direction, but they still, it's longer on this side, this line is, than it is near the upper left circle. So that brings your eye from the left to the right. It's interesting that the two grid areas that we talked here, they go off of the frame on the right. And a lot of the larger, thicker lines through the center also go up to the right. Now there's variety as well, right? Because we have a lot of other lines going on. We have a few vertical lines. We have a few horizontal lines that break the other lines. We have just a couple lines going in the opposite direction. Um, whether they're going from left to right pointing down or from right to left pointing up, I don't know. And then we also have half lines that are open half circles down here at the bottom. And then lines that are almost literal arrows pointing to this little spot of a bullseye in that central part of the triangle. The lines are really, really interesting here. They lead the eye all over the place, but you're absolutely right also that this space on the lower left is the only empty place. So starting from this empty place with these heavy lines here gives your place an eye to start and then it gets more and more complex as it goes towards the right. One thing about this piece that's interesting to me is that I am normally drawn to ovals or circles. Mm -hmm. and I disregard them. I, uh, that's interesting. I had never thought about that. But this big one up in the air, up in the uh, Le upper left hand corner just becomes a uh, background to me. I'm so much more interested in what the lines are doing. Interesting like because one of our other viewers said that this was her kind of starting point and it felt like it was lifted above the rest of the things. Maybe that's Thank why you. it does feel like it's lifted above and so I disregard it as not part of it. <laughs> okay, very good. Irene, have you talked to us yet? No, I, I'm very interested in his use of arcs and how um, we have a horizontal line of arcs and underneath it he has got more arcs. Um, then 
my does my pointer register with you then we have what suggests arcs but are distorted arcs we've got an arc here we've got arcs here there are arcs scattered through it and those are the things that intrigue me and i'm sort of wondering how much he thought about where he placed them were they important you know I have no idea, but it is, it is really interesting. Another way to create unity besides just simple repetition is proximity, having things touch each other. Um, if, if all of us were standing in a room together, just imagine the good old days when we could do that. And no matter how differently we looked or we were dressed, if three of us were holding hands, we would look like we belong together, right? We would look like a group. Um, so anytime you have things, elements touching each other in a work of art, they feel like they belong together. And if you look at this piece, almost all of the elements touch something else. There are, it's, it's a very much overlapped grouping as you go toward the center. There's a few things that stand on their own, especially on the left. Um, on the right, there's a few things that barely don't touch, but they're kind of contained by the other shapes. Um, these arcs, they all touch this horizontal line. They touch the vertical line in the center. They touch each other. And then the rest of the open arcs as they cascade down also touch each other. There are many shapes that are all connected because they touch part of the lines that connect them all together. So they are a really interesting part of the piece. And also, in the chaos of all these different shapes, it's interesting that this large triangle is bisected by a line in the center and then these arcs balanced on either side of that, that kind of gives it a centering and a stability and a grounding that it might not have. This is another thing that I would cover up with my fingers as I looked at it and feel, do I need those there? And those arcs on that line kind of, even though they're a small part of the composition, they give it quite a bit of stability, don't you think? They give it, um, there's one small bit of symmetry in this piece that's full of flying shapes and wild chaos. Very you good to bring that I up. I thought it was interesting, the arcs, because my eye immediately thought, saw this and sort of thought, it's a series of arcs, but they're um, not geometrically correct, if you want to call them a true arc but they reflect the same sort of thing. Interesting. Very good. Thank you. Becky, have you had a turn to talk to us? You're muted. Yes, I went first. We talked okay. about the uh, horn <laughs> shape. I really need to keep like lists. <laughs> All right. Who has not had a turn? Karen? Yes. All right. Okay, one thing that um, we've touched on a little bit, but it's circles. Mm -hmm. He has put circles in the upper left hand corner inside, inside each other. But then the circles are all over the place. Um, and, and a lot of the circles, but not all, have halos. You know, the red is around, the black and purple. Mm -hmm. the yellow, but yet the next, if you're going counterclockwise, the next circle is reverse. It's blue with the yellow halo. And then as you come around, again, going counterclockwise, you've got three or four circles with no halo. But then as we get into the upper right-hand corner, we've got a misplaced halo. And so he's using the circles in different sizes. Some have a circle inside, um, down in that big right. checker, checkerboard at the left side. 
he's got, you know, arcs or semicircles. So it's the repetition, as with many other things, of of these circles. Um, Very good. That just kept my eye, you know, and and from that in size, from that tiny little red one to that great big black and, and red. Um, there's so much in this to talk about. Isn't, isn't it fun? You look at it glancing by the first time and it's just, you know, let's throw whatever shapes and lines we can on here. But when you're talking about unity, when you're talking about visual harmony, um, there's so much here <laughs> that yeah. creates that and keeps that when it could be complete chaos. And I love that you mentioned the halos. That's a texture that's different on one side than everything else. There's no pieces on the right that have these fuzzy halos around them, just right. those four circles. Well, actually, down in this checkerboard on the left, around the edges of some of these mm -hmm. softer circles, the texture is a little bit softer, this piece on the left. But notice on the right side of the painting, there's no fuzziness. The, the color transitions are much cleaner. Um, but there is enough repetition throughout the piece of that fuzziness that they don't look out of place. This is a case where if there weren't the fuzzy halos around the two circle, the yellow circle on the bottom left and the, blue circle on the center bottom left, that that big black circle on the upper right would look completely out of place with a halo. I think it's also interesting that the red circle right next to the black has interrupted the halo of red, but then it has its own yellow halo. So the variation in, in how he's, where he's placed them has me fascinated. This whole thing is fascinating, isn't it? Um, yeah. And and it's true. The more I look at it, and the more you talk about the different elements and just describe what they are and where they are and what they're doing, it's kind of one of those things where how on earth did he create a piece that doesn't look like a giant mess out of all these different things? And it's through those. Um, through those devices of repetition, repetition of all the elements, line direction, line weight, color, intensity, um, shapes and their direction and their kinds, circles and triangles. Um, but again, there's so much variety here, but it all works together. There's just enough of each one. You could probably take out a few of the elements here, a few of the shapes, a few of the colors or something, and it would be okay still, but it also works with all of them in here. So we're about 15 minutes before the hour. Um, I am going to just leave us with this one painting because there's so many interesting, interesting things about it. I will post the painting on our Facebook group. Is there anybody here who's having trouble getting into it? I know there's two or three people who tried to join but didn't answer the questions and I sent them messages saying you have to answer the questions because I really want people to have um, at least experienced or watched one of the videos of this so they understand the methodology that we use in in the analysis. So I'm going to post this in the Facebook group and continue your analysis. We only talked about unity. You can talk about focal point. You can talk about rhythm and motion, all the other principles and elements that we have talked about or have not talked about. I would love you to continue your analysis of this. And at the beginning, I assigned everybody, um, if you'd like to participate in the Facebook group, to find an artwork that to you exemplifies the principle of unity, visual harmony, harmony in a work. So let's just for a minute or two, do any of you have questions for me? And it's okay if we end early. I'm kind of tired today. <laughs>
lyric? Yes. I need the password to our group meeting number. I could get in on a larger tablet, but I didn't have the password. Okay. I will look it up right now and see if I can find it. I know they don't change. So once I record it, I could watch you on my tablet or have the bigger screen available. That would be helpful. Do you want to write it down or just have me post it in chat? Whatever works. I have a pencil. If I didn't know if anyone else had that problem or not, but. Can you all see chat? Because I'd rather post it there and not have it in the recording. It would be wonderful. That means I have to copy and paste it. I'm sorry. No. Nope. I had it over there and did not. There it is. Can you all see it? In chat? If you click chat. I, I see. Uh, if you click chat, a, a window should come up. I'm and on an iPad. Does anybody know where chat is on the iPad? Look at look at the bottom of your screen. I don't see anything. Touch it, the bottom of your well, screen? Take your cursor down to the bottom of the screen. Well, it's an iPad. I'm touching the bottom of the screen. There's nothing there. Well, can you take your finger on the iPad and run it? I'll just tell you guys and I'll edit this out because I'm going to post the video publicly. I don't want to have it. So you have something to write down? Yes. The password is 641575. 641575. And it is always the same Zoom link to get on. Thank you. Uh, can I thank ask a question? I, yes. I, didn't, I didn't need a password to get in today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't need one. Okay. She might have called in. I took the link off of the uh, email from last week. Right. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I was just curious. All right, thanks. Yeah, the mysteries of technology, who knows? <laughs> all right, it has been an absolute pleasure to be with you all again this week. Thank you for coming. And let's continue the conversation on the Facebook group. We will see you there. Thank you.